Hey, I appreciate you uh, meeting with us. Um, my coworker is muted because he's watching two of his kids. Ah. So he's listening, but he is will be in and out if he says anything. So all right. With our matter of not being at school, it's kind of put us in the. Yeah, the go go figure, right? <laughs> Yeah, gotta love this fire. Yeah, yeah, I had I had uh, three or four other school interviews, and uh, yeah. yeah, gone. Yeah, has this been a has this been a common thing for you lately? Is interviewing with schools and things? Oh yeah, yeah, a lot of schools. Uh, did a couple of universities. In fact, tomorrow I've got um, a university out in the Netherlands. That, uh, huh? but yeah, like our meetups. How can we do meetups if you're not supposed to meet up? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> conferences. Yeah. I mean, we had conferences in Italy. <laughs> that wasn't going to go well. Yeah, uh, Israel. That one canceled on me. Uh, mm -hmm. UK. I, well, as you know, I mean. Yeah, it's it's everywhere anymore. Yeah, it's and it's going to keep on spreading. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's every day. I mean, I have to check the headlines basically every couple hours just to just to see what the hell's going on. <laughs> yeah. Now, here in Ohio, it's just like every hour you hear about something else, and it's just day after day. Wow, it's crazy. So, what do you? How, how do you want to do this? Well, well first, 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 if you don't mind, I'll step in and introduce myself. I'm AJ Schmidtmeyer. Uh, Hi. I'm going to be listening in while my two-year-old and eight-week-old are making noise in the background. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, it's just like Dustin was saying. Thanks a lot for meeting with us. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Happy, happy to do it. Are you kidding? It's what I do yeah. all the time. Um, is it okay if we record this? Because we yeah. want to show it. Her. Okay, I just yeah. want to make sure. Sure. It was all packed so, um, I watched your uh, series on Netflix last night, or the Behind the Curve. Right. That was a uh, very, very, very interesting. <laughs> I liked it. It was. Uh, that was an interesting process. Uh, you know, they followed us. That's a couple of years old now. Um, yeah. They followed us for seven months, and by the time they got to the end, uh, they hated. Yeah, the director was really interesting. The director just hated the whole concept. He didn't hate us. He hated the whole concept to really? where uh, he didn't even – I didn't even know if he was going to push it. He's like, yeah, we're never going to get any film festivals. No one's ever going to buy it. It's like, it's, it's like it resonated just so quickly, and now I, I'm sure it just haunts him. Because because he burned everybody all the bridges when he was making it. So, yeah. Anyway. For sure. Um, so first off, um, you know our students kind of came together and we kind of came up with some questions because the way our seventh grade content goes is we introduce Earth and we talk about how it's a sphere and we talk about the rotation revolution. Sure. And it's more of an introduction. And so what we did is um, it also starts talking about early beliefs and this is how we got into flat Earth. Yeah. Is we talk about how people used to think Earth was flat. And so my coworker, who you just heard from AJ, I think it was a year or two ago, he uh, saw, I think it was Nightline that interviewed you. It was for your conference. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah. the, AB, the ABC piece. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So what we did is we shared it with the class. It was only a seven minute clip. And they were very, very intrigued <laughs> about, you know, well, what about this? And what about this? And like, you know, I. I could only know so much of what, you know, we would get from the seven minute clip of what you can find online. Right. So we tried to reach out last year, um, but I didn't have your email. I guess I didn't look, really search hard enough. And then this I about year, say, I'm out. it's easy to find. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, this year it happened again. Like, you know, let's just try this again. So we, we share that video again. And the kids are really, 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 really interested. Cool. And so we compiled some questions. Uh, I mean, we had probably over 60 or 70 questions. Obviously, oh, wow. we're not going to ask all 60 or 70. Oh, no. That, uh, yeah. It's, that's how it starts. I mean, everybody, when they first get introduced to it, I either get, what about this and how does this work? Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, okay, here we go. I mean, and again, I, I don't mind. I mean, that's part of the process. Yeah. And, I, and, you know, the way that we always teach science is, you know, science is unknown. We're still trying to figure everything out. And we look at everyone's ways and, you know, and we don't judge. And that's how we go. So, no. hey, and, you're, that's, and that's how I've taught science. You're nicer you're, than most. I mean, Neil, <laughs> Neil Tyson's statement, which I love so much, is that science is true whether or not you believe in it. And it's like, okay. It's like, yeah, I don't know if I'd put that stamp on everything, but go ahead. So do we have, yeah. are there names associated with these questions or? No, I don't okay. have names associated with them at all. Okay. So I tried to stay away from names. I had them actually not even put their names on the, on the Oh, cards. okay. So we kind of more of anonymous type thing. So. Got it. 
if you're ready. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, so, you know, we've seen a picture of a model of, Antar or of Earth. We saw Antarctica goes around. Yeah. Uh, the very first one was what would happen, you know, we talk about global warming, you know, the ice started melting. What would happen then? That's a great question. In fact, I'm amazed at your first question uh, because we've been getting, I've been getting the climate change questions now for a couple of years. Not in the mm -hmm. beginning, but now, yes. If it is an enclosed system, if it is, you know, a giant snow globe, a giant building, you know, what a couple things. One, because the first question usually people ask me is, does climate change even exist in a flat Earth model? And I said, yeah, as a matter of fact, it, it makes a lot more sense in a flat Earth model because the, the flat model is a, a closed pressurized system. In fact, the I always thought it was funny that they called it greenhouse gases. It's like, wouldn't the greenhouse gases make more sense if it was an actual greenhouse? Not this whole open, yeah. open space idea. Um so if the ice melts, what happens? I mean, does does the the sea level rise? Yeah, probably. Although if it's a part of an automated system, it probably has to try to compensate for some of that. I don't know. I mean, the 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 ice levels dropping and the sea levels rising would be gradual enough to where you know we wouldn't probably see much in our lifetime along those lines. But would would everything rise? Yeah, sure. I mean, again, you know, if 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 you're talking about in fact. Let me, dig up one of my props if you are talking about a you know an ice wall the inside of you know this sort of thing yeah would the sea levels rise eventually sure yeah okay so i mean so the sea levels rise obviously we still have the crust would it, would water run I mean, quote unquote run off or what would happen to the water no 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 because again and and i know if the kids are watching this uh, you're talking about a literal self-contained system. Uh, as my friend, my friend would like to say, we're living basically in an, in an Antarctic basin. You're living in a giant saltwater lake, which is on in the inside of a building. You know, so when people ask, it's like, well, why doesn't why doesn't the water fall off? You know, I get that so many times, and, and the movie Thor and the whole Asgard thing did us no favors whatsoever because that whole cosmic waterfall. Um, it's no different than why doesn't water fall off of, of a lake? Well, because the lake's enclosed. And mm -hmm. That's that's basically the short version. And which is also interesting because most people don't know the the Antarctic continent is uh, mostly a, a, even if you mainstream science says it's a high plateau, of around fourteen thousand feet high. It's basically a, a high a high frozen desert, and it's like wow. I mean, even even if the water wanted to go somewhere, you know, it's not going anywhere. That continent is just way different from anything else. Yeah, and I found it interesting. That was one of your documentaries that you did where, you know, we're like basic banned from Antarctica. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Again, that, it's... That was something I never even, you know, never knew. Before nobody does. It. Yeah. It's, it's your, your it's, it's the only unbroken treaty in the history of treaties, even now. It's not even up for renewal until uh, 2041. That no country, no matter how big and powerful you are, can set up shop there. And, and I, that was what, one of the first things that I just called BS on because I'm going, okay, okay. So we can frack in your backyard tomorrow. <laughs> we can get in there right now. And yet with billions at our disposal, we, we're not allowed to even touch it. In fact, that was, I'm sorry, one more thing. We're not even allowed to talk about it. You're not even, you're not even allowed to run a newspaper article, you know, saying, oh, what, how great it would be for Exxon Mobil to, to go down there. Full page ad in the newspapers? Nope. You're not allowed to talk about it. Fascinating. Crazy. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Um, so another one, um, and you kind of talked, touched about this on your series or the behind the curve, but uh, why can you not see mountains at a distance when looking across a flat feet? Dun, dun, dun. No, no, it's great. That's a great one. And again, it's because the average, no offense to, to science teachers, um, the average person by the time they get through high school is taught very little in the lines of physics or engineering or chemistry or, or even biology. Um, but the air we're breathing in right now is basically just a thin version of water. You know, it's 80%. We'll, we'll get rid of the trace gases. It's 80% nitrogen and 20% oxygen. It's, it's a soup, which is why, you know, clouds are suspended in the air. People say, why are clouds fall to the ground? It's like, well, because the clouds are just visible. Everything else is kind of like the clouds. Um, and it gets thicker over the time. So you're only, what we're looking at, you and I are looking between, is only like 99% transparent. It gets thicker and thicker and thicker at distance. No different than um, uh, when you're a diver. Uh, all divers will tell you this. When you get down to like even 150, 180 feet, sun's gone. You know, high, high sun, perfect sun, summer day, you know, sun's right above you. You cannot see it. Why? Because the sun can't penetrate the, that dense of a, of, um, 
a liquid. No different with us. So the, the question this person had was like, why can't you see uh, Japan from San Francisco? Why can't you see Europe from New York? Why can't you see Mount Everest from everywhere? Because it's the highest place. Why can't you? Well, because it's just thick. In fact, when you're at sea level, the, I think the furthest distance you can see, even on a good day with this soup, is about 150 miles, give or take. And you shouldn't even be able to see that because of the curvature of the earth. But that's the answer. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Um, so we kind of looked at your model, and I think you referred to some kind of like being like a spotlight. Yeah. Uh, so with that, uh, why can we not always see it in the distance? Since, you know, it would disappear from the view as the Earth rotated. No, it's good. All right. So if the sun and the moon are spinning above us like a mobile above a child's crib, why the, 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 one of the first questions that people come to me with is, why can't you see the sun from everywhere? Mm -hmm. And it's like, in fact, the the follow up to that is like, why do we even have time zones? It's like, why why isn't just daylight all the time? And it's like, okay, here's the reason. The reason is because the sun is very, 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 very small. Um, in fact, we can't even draw it accurately. Like this model doesn't even have a sun and moon on it, because in order to draw the sun and the moon the scale that we want it to, you can it's it's bare, not, not even visible, basically, It'd be like a single pixel. Because we're talking about a sun and the moon, each of them which would be maybe less than 50 miles wide. But every model that you see, in fact, you go on the internet and you type in flat earth model, every sun and the moon that you see there, they're massive. They're thousands of miles wide, at least. You know, which is weird because the moon supposedly is 2,000 miles wide. And the, the sun, you know, they, they, they take the sun down to maybe 1,000 or 2,000 miles wide, but it's way, way too big. So the short answer is, is that the sun is so small that it can't shine over everything because it's just physically too small. And, and we've seen this with physical models and computer models. It just doesn't give off that much light. And then because of the thickness of the atmosphere, it just goes off into the distance like an airplane and eventually just fades away. People say, well, it sets. And it's like, oh, no, I can show you some wonderful videos where you, it looks like it's setting. And if you have a decent enough HD camera, you zoom in, the sun pops back up and it shouldn't, and it shouldn't be able to. So what supports the, the sun up there then? The what? That's kind of what kind of supports the sun out there then? Since it's kind of like a spot. I, at that point, we're talking, we're, we're talking, what, what keeps the sun in the sky and the moon in the sky? Yeah. Uh, you're talking about engineering things that are way beyond us. Uh, you know, who, who knows what's holding it up there? Some sort of unified field, some electromagnetic field. I mean, it's basically just a light bulb being held, but what is it being suspended by? I don't know, a super electromagnetic thing? Okay, I mean, so we can. So if that spins, do, does Earth still spin, or is it basically just stationary? No, no, the Earth doesn't move. I mean, this thing... You, no, no movement at all. You, you have to get rid of it. I mean, if this is it, right? You yeah. know, I'm, I'm saying this is literally what, what the representation could be. That's it. It's not doing anything. Um, in fact, you have to throw out not only astrophysics and astronomy, basically, but most of your, most of your math. I mean, because you're talking, you know, when you have to describe the solar system, you know, the normal solar system, you're getting into geometry and trigonometry and calculus and quantum mechanics and all that other stuff. This, you barely need anything. So, no, it doesn't have to move at all. It can just be sitting somewhere. I mean, who, in fact, who's to say there isn't 7 billion little critters living in this thing right now? Yeah. So, there's, there's no such thing as rotation revolution with a flat model. No, no, no. Why would, you don't need it. There's, there's okay. no, there's no reason to have it. Anything you can do, you can create artificially. Okay. And since you start talking about our solar system, what do you think about all the other planets that we have out there? Are they just flat as well? No, 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 no. They're just light. They're just lights in the sky. Um, no different. And I know the kids that are listening to this are going to be too young, but, um, in planetariums, it's the great argument I throw at people all the time. Thank God we have planetariums because it's like okay do you see Ju i've had literally people i say do you see jupiter you know on on in this planetarium yes yes i do can you land on it no why not well because does it look spherical yes it does can you land on it no why not well because it's just a light on the ceiling i go yeah who's to say when you walk out of that building you're just not in a much much bigger building that's what we're talking about here you're talking about that we are in a building with walls and a floor and a ceiling and everything you see in the sky is just part of a it's it's just a giant light show uh, when it's not just a light show it's really the the most elaborate clock system ever built you know a universal clock system that you don't even need numbers for you know it, it predates all language and all numbers interesting yeah. um so kind of continuing with uh moving the sun and things like that so obviously there's no more tilt 
because you know we talk about the tilt uh, on our axis is totally oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah 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 associates with our seasons and so on yeah. so how do we get seasons then Seasons, a combination of a couple things. Um, first off is that the sun and the moon don't have to, tr well, if they're, and I don't have the, I, a great graphic would be, and I'll send you the video for it. Um, there's an app out there that we made for this called the, um, uh, the Flat Earth Sun, Moon, and Zodiac Clock app. But the, the sun and the moon basically are like a needle on a record player. And if you're old enough to remember vinyl where you know the needle goes in as the song progresses and if you back if you put it in reverse it goes out so the sun and the moon don't take the same tracks in fact heck we they may not even take the same elevation as far as we know but between that and the other parts of the system that you could deal with the seasons pretty easily i mean i'm also saying that the sun wouldn't be the only heat source uh you could also compensate with the jet stream the underwater conveyor system that does all the, the water you know because the, the water carries a huge amount of energy in it um the the magma system below that but between all of them that nah, the seasons aren't so hard gotcha um so let's go inside earth a little bit since we've talked about there like the composition layers so is there still a mantle is there still a core what, what's your opinion based on oh okay well if you know my videos <laughs> that was one of the ones that really really bugged me because uh you know i had to i had to learn a lot of different scientific factoids when I, in fact i've relearned more actual science doing this than than just about anything so imagine oh yeah it's amazing um so imagine this so we've all seen those cutaway those those cross sections of the earth right with orange perfect perfect 1000 mile layers but orange and yellow and white and i'm sorry red orange yellow white and it's like wow it's really really great how, how do you got how do you get that and it's like what's the deepest hole ever drilled well in the core of the earth if you believe in the globe is 4000 miles to the center uh what's the deepest hole ever drilled 2000 1000 100 and it's not even 10 it's eight miles and the germans and the russians tried this for decades try to get past eight miles nobody can get past eight miles so if you can't drill past eight miles what exactly are you showing me with this cross section of the earth and, and in fact in it used to be in small print for years and years in textbooks which was we don't actually know what what the core of the earth looks like it's we're just guessing based off of volcanic stuff and it's like you know volcanic stuff we're not even talking three or four miles you know, depending mm -hmm. on, on what volcano you're looking at. So, and then you're showing us cross sections of, not you, uh, but you're, you're showing us cross sections of Neptune and Jupiter and Saturn. It's like, even if you could convince me that you could do the Earth, what are you showing me there? So, yeah, so again, it, at some point we took out the fine print. And so now we just show people cross sections. And the reason is, is because science is really, they've gotten into a nasty habit of not allowing the question mark to be there. I mean, the Earth literally should be the Earth, if it's a globe, with a big question mark on the inside. That's what it should be. But science will not do that because they're science. You know, they're, they're like, nope, we're the authority. This is our best guess. But if you don't keep saying that, eventually people just take it as the gospel. I mean, you know, you show somebody a cross section by the time they graduate from high school. Oh, yeah, that's what the core of the Earth looks like. And then I have to remind them, you know, how far we haven't gone. So I use my eighth grade terminology because we talk about this in eighth grade. We go into uh, inside of Earth and we talk about seismic waves and how they travel. And, sure. And so on. Um, so how can you relate this with earthquakes? And there's a lot of earthquakes and seismic waves because the way that I teach is, you know, as you're talking about your P and S waves as they travel through, mm -hmm. your P waves will slow down once you hit the outer core is what they, you know, what they teach us. But your S waves will stop because they can't travel through water. Hmm. So that's that's the way that we teach it as you know here in the state of Ohio. That's that's how we know what's inside side of inside of Earth. Yeah, that that's fine. I, again, yeah. I, I I know what, I know what some of the stuff you teach, and I'm saying mm -hmm. that with our model, the plate tectonics and everything else works just as well. Now, again, the the assumptions that are made, we don't want to delve into this too far because it's probably above eighth graders, but <laughs> but. The, the seismic wave stuff is based on an assumption that it was a globe to begin with. And so you okay. will make the math work one way or the other. Kind of like how they say, oh, yeah, the sun is this size. Really? How do you know the sun's that size? Because it's like, oh, we just do. You know, there was a, there was, there was a guess made there. It's like you never sent a probe to the sun. You've never circled the sun. No, no one's ever done that. So sure. we, where, where are you getting that from? Anyway, go ahead. Um, so last question based off this, uh, inside of Earth at least. 
Um, so you still believe in plate tectonics and, and earthquakes and yeah. how all that stuff shifts. Okay. So yeah. it still has to do with a little bit of magma below. And oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Pla okay. Plate tectonics. Okay, yeah, yeah. I, I have no okay. problem with earthquakes and plate tectonics and, uh, you know, you know, plates going under and over and, you know, that Correct. type of thing. Got, got no problem with that. Okay. I was just making sure. So how far do you think... We can get, I mean, not how far, how far deep do you think it is in your flat model is like to the bottom of earth? Or do we even know? Well, luckily for me, I don't have to, or say luckily for us, uh, I don't have to go that far because remember the eight mile thing. So, I mean, if it was me, I mean, you wouldn't have to make it very thick. I mean, for something like this, I mean, good Lord. If you look at this, maybe a couple hundred miles, but. Okay. There has to be some subterranean system down there. No question. Sure. Um, does it have to be very, very deep? No, it does not. Uh, but again, since we haven't gone, since we haven't, nobody's gone past eight miles, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go that far. I'm going to say it's, it's like not going to it's, it's a big question. Mark. Yeah, it's not going to be very thick, though. It's not going to be, yeah. it's not going to be 4,000 miles thick. It doesn't have to be. Okay. Um, let see. So we kind of talk a little bit about the atmosphere. So do we still, in your GLOW model, still have our atmospheric layers all the way up until we teach up to the exosphere? Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah you, you bet. Um, in fact, in fact, the atmospheric layers for us work way better because it's a pressurized system, which is okay. why, you know, the thing that I throw at, at kids and teachers, I say, okay, you know, it, there's something about the Earth that really bugs us a lot, which is the the absolute violation of, of one of the laws of thermodynamics, which says, I know the kids are like, thermodynamics, that's a terrible word, which says that pressure can't exist next to non-pressure without a barrier. Cannot happen. Never, ever, 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 ever. Which means, so like, every, you, you know, the, the easy version, you blow up a balloon in your hand, you let it go with your finger, what happens? every single time that balloon's going off why because the pressure is trying to release no different with a basketball and a football and a volleyball you put pressure in it it gets really really tight the point is is you have to put it in something so the the question i throw to any class is i go say there's a second floor to your building right now you make a little vacuum chamber of it right it doesn't even have to be that big but you know maybe as big as the room maybe not and you put a cork in the ceiling and you pop it what happens it is not like the movies. It is absolutely instantaneous. It is violent. You're going to black out. You may even die. You know, it's not like it's not like Star Trek and Star Wars and aliens where it's like, there's a hole in the side of the ship. Quick, we only got two minutes of air left. Get the duct tape. It is not like that. You can, there's some wonderful videos on YouTube. Um, one, one of my favorites is steel rail car versus vacuum. The Germans, for whatever reason, have this fascination with doing this where they take a steel rail car and they apply a vacuum field to the end inside of it. And it's just, it's amazing how violent it is. It's just so fast. So the question is, and I put this to ask full blown astrophysicists. Yeah. You know, so the question is, okay, so when you pop the cork in your ceiling right now, why didn't the gravity in your room keep the air in your room? Why did it go upstairs? And you say, well, because the gravity wasn't strong enough to stop the vacuum. And you're absolutely right. Vacuum will beat gravity every single time. In fact, the, 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 the small version is when you suck a soda out of a glass with a straw, you know, why didn't the gravity keep the, in, you know, you're, you're creating a very small vacuum force with your mouth, right? So the question is, when you walk outside, why is the air still there? Because there is a huge vacuum chamber, the biggest of all time above you. And I know your instinct is becomes, well, because of gravity. You go, no, 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 no. I mean, the same gravity that couldn't even keep the air in your room, the exact same gravity. And then you're kind of stuck, which is why I put the question out there. I said, where is the bleeding edge of space? And I know textbooks will say, well, the bleeding edge of space stop, you know, is around here. Yeah. And, but they won't tell you what happens there. It's like, okay, so is it sort of, it kind of flakes off? And it's like, sorry, I'm not buying it. Yeah, I can see that. Um, so uh, it comes to your lunar and solar eclipses. Yep. Um, so why are they not uh, every year in the same location? So with your model, with the sun and the moon placement, why are they not always at the same location? Every single year? That's an, that's First off, I guess you, no, that's a good, that's a good question. Was, that's a good question. Okay. If you got to remember that part of this system, part of this whole thing is that this thing has Sorry, to. Sorry, I'm losing it here. Uh oh. Am I... Oh, here, let me let me kill my uh, email system. One second. One second. All right, how's that? Is that better? 
Okay. Is that better? Maybe. Yeah, now we're good. Now we're okay, good. okay. So, um, so, so you got to remember that part of the, uh, the, the reason for building, the, creating the globe model is because this is a great model, super efficient, really, really great. The problem with this yeah. is that the people inside don't like this. <laughs> Meaning uh, yeah. human beings have a real, real problem with confinement. So eventually you have to create the illusion of a solar system. We didn't do this. We didn't build this. Whoever built this, built this. And I'm not saying, you know, I'm separation of church and state. I'm not saying it's the divine necessarily. It could be an advanced civilization that's much older and much more powerful than ourselves. But the reason why you create the globe model in that, you know, you create solar eclipses and lunar eclipses and the planets going in different places is because human beings can't hate confinement. Uh, the quick example is the uh, the wildlife preserve, which is you create a thousand acre wildlife reserve. You know, you put some buffalo in it, right? Thousand acres, plenty of room, right? I mean, they got streams, they got trees. There's a fence there. They don't care. Buffalo couldn't be. It's like, this is great, right? You put 10 people in that same thousand acre wild preserve. All they're going to care about is the freaking fence. It's all they care. Human beings have this curiosity. It's like, why is the fence there? Who built the fence? Why are we on that side? Is who's on the other side? Uh, have we angered the fence makers? Maybe we should sacrifice things to the fence. Grab the buffalo, and then it just goes on from there. You know, and then they start building churches in, in the fence's name. So when it comes to anything in the sky, and and I'm kind of getting my head ahead of myself, but the solar eclipses and the moon eclipses and everything you're talking about, just again, just a giant elaborate clock system which is made to create the illusion of the solar system because you have to get rid of the fence. That's, that's the key here. You can't let people know there's a, an edge to this world because all they'll care about is the edge. They won't act naturally anymore. They'll just, they'll just be constantly, and, and again, you also slow down the progress of technology. Remember, we didn't. what I'm saying about this thing is we didn't even know. Our best and brightest didn't even know until about 1960. That's how big it was. We remember in 1960, our technology, you know, pressurized planes and helicopters and stuff. We were barely doing Arctic stuff, you know, by, by that point, you know, any good Arctic stuff. So when they found out their civilization was already built, which might even be in one of your follow-up questions, like, which is why hide it? Why, why keep it from people? Which is, mm -hmm. are you kidding? Civilization's already pretty much been matured at that point. By 1960, if you tell people, the potential chaos ripples are astounding. Of what might happen i mean look what's happening right now with a simple bug yeah <laughs> imagine sure. what, imagine what this would do yeah thank you so um talking about you know if our model of rotation of earth we talk about the uh the wind patterns yeah. and going with the coriolis effect so how does that play a role in your flat earth model no different i I I kind of lump the wind patterns and like hurricanes versus typhoons and clockwise versus counterclockwise or even the star patterns. If you're if you're going to go down that road, you know the the star patterns going clockwise versus clockwise uh, counterclockwise, depending on if you're above or below the equator. And I've seen time lapse stuff of that. Um, mo all of it's artificial though, and that is especially when we'll do we'll do the sky first and we'll go down to the to to the weather patterns. With the sky, you're talking about multiple projection systems, which is in a planetarium, you're looking at all the stars, but it's all just one projection system because it's very, very small. But with something as big as this, you get to get away with a lot more clever trickery, meaning you're on one side, your you're friends in Australia, and you're here. You're both looking at the belt of Orion. You both think you're looking at the same belt of Orion, but are you really? Um, it's something we've been doing in software for the last 15 years called instancing, which means that it, you're, you're, the visual th effects that you're looking at are proprietary to geographics or maybe even uh, the individual, which you can do. Now, when it comes to the stuff on the ground, like if you're going um, clockwise versus counterclockwise, that wouldn't be hard to do necessarily. I mean, with some artificial physics, you know, molecular gravity. Uh, gravity wells. Uh, the other things you could do would be um, uh, there's something. Oh, oh, look, uh, far. In fact, let me get into this real quick because I'm sure one of your one of your kids asked this, which was uh, water circling in. Because if you're going to, uh, typhoons versus uh, hurricanes, water circling down the drain, one you know clockwise versus counterclockwise, utter myth. 
Oh my god, I yeah. didn't even know this was a. I, I I thought it was you know everyone grows up. It's like hey, you know the toilets go in the opposite direction when they're in Australia. It's like really do they? There's this one. In fact, you may even know this. Uh, um, if you're a science person, there's a, a big giant YouTube channel called uh, Smarter Every Day. You ever heard of it? Oh yeah, look up this guy. He's great. He loves doing these little science experiments. He's got millions and millions of subs, and he's he doesn't like us at all. But he did yeah. a, he did a thing some years ago called um, toilet water, you know, to, the toilet water experiment. We was going, you know, I heard a thing that toilet water spins and one, and so he set up this the most fantastic test where simultaneously, you know, they were FaceTiming this thing and they set up these these kids waiting pools with a central drain, identical pools, you know, and they let the water sit for hours, so it was absolutely perfectly still, and then they used um, eye droppers with food coloring instead of boats, and, you know, in this cross pattern. And then pulled the drains at the same time and watched, you know, and, and did time lapse. And he said the effect was so negligible that he goes, he, he could not confirm it. He goes, I don't know how this myth started, but it, it he goes, I, I don't know where it came from. And it's like, yeah, that's what we would expect. However, if you wanted to do it again, you could treat it no differently than the tides. I know I'm rambling a little bit, but the, but the, um, the tides would might even be another one of your questions. Like how do the tides work? Which is okay. Uh, the same effect of gravity, because that may also be a question. It's like, do we believe in gravity? Yeah, I do, but I don't think it's just gravity. I also think buoyancy and density has, has something to play because it's a pressurized system. You can you can use the both in tandem. But when it comes to uh, the tides, do you? What's easier to do? Do you use it with the same artificial gravity system that's down below the same physics engine, or do you hook up some weird, complex directional gravitational force to the moon? Mm -hmm. You use the lower thing. It's the easier one to, to do. I mean, yeah, you could do it with the moon, but what a pain in the ass it would be. Sorry, I shouldn't say ass. Um, <laughs> right. But uh, but it would be, um, considering the moon's only 50 miles wide, give or take, it would be way more pro problematic to do. Sorry, I, I know I'm jumping in different no, directions. No. but No, no, you're fine. Um, so one student want to know, what is your greatest piece of evidence that Earth is flat? Long and distance, why are you so confident with this? Long distance photography. And I did not come up with this. Um, when I did the clues, I never even hinted it. Long distance photography. Didn't even think people could do it. Because I didn't even know, when I first came out with it, I thought there, there might have been some bends and bows to this thing. It was more like a roulette table. And then people yeah. said, and then people immediately wrote me and they said, well, you can't use a roulette table as an example. And I said, why not? And they said, well, because all the numbers of the roulette table add up to 666. And I go, is that true? And it is. It's absolutely true. It's like, wow, it's wow. super creepy. But that's fine. <laughs> um, so they said, no, it's perfectly flat. And what people were doing was they were running out to the beaches and um, shooting these long distance photography things with HD cameras. And that's really what's changed. So they're shooting boats at, and I could show you some wonderful, I'll send you some links when we're done some wonderful okay. links of videos of boats and oil rig platforms and lighthouses and, and things that should be on the other side of the curve. They should be behind the curve, which is interesting because Daniel called it that. I know he was doing it, tried to, you know, the director was trying to do that in a derogatory way, but whatever. But it's true, which is there should be nothing behind the curve because everything you're looking at should be over the hill. Meaning, forget about the side to side stuff. When you're looking off into the distance, the curvature of the earth is when you're we're talking to, we're not going to use the special geometry uh when you're talking less than 500 miles the curvature of the earth is eight inches per mile squared which is eight inches per mile per mile easy enough right so it's three miles it's three times three is nine times eight is 72. 10 miles is 10 times 10 100 times eight is 800 inches and it gets worse and worse you know if it's supposed to be a curve to where like even 50 miles you're talking 16 1700 feet of curvature which means whatever object you're looking at should be obscured by that much curvature absolutely but it's not and it's not almost in and yeah i know you're dealing with some weather conditions refraction fatim organa atmospheric lensing but there are objects out there on a good day depending on what soup you're looking through which are amazingly clear and not only that in fact the my greatest example which i'll, I'll send you when we're done um, is we and we missed this for the first couple of years, which was you can see the horizon behind these objects. That shouldn't hmm. be. So if you're seeing the objects, you know, at 10 miles and 15 miles or whatever it is, there, you know, and, and remember, it's also related to how high your camera is off the water. 
You shouldn't yeah. be able, you know, you only see these objects so far, but at the very least, the horizon should be cutting off in front of it. That's the point. The horizon should be cutting these things off and the horizon is way beyond it. So, and that's not how mirages work. I mean, I don't care if it's a superior or inferior mirage. The, the, you sh the horizon should never, ever be behind these things. And, and no one can ever explain that to me. And until where now the trolls are coming at us and saying, well, it's an apparent horizon versus the geometric horizon. I'm going, so you can never see the geometric horizon? They're going, no, that's invisible. I go, okay, what's that? And they go, that's the apparent horizon. I go, yeah, but it's behind these objects. And then they shut up usually. <laughs> so that's our by far our strongest argument because it's so you know most of our civilization lives next to some sort of water so that's mm -hmm. what people have been doing to where i've told people i said find me an object that you can't see that you know it's let's say just say it's 50 100 miles away we'll ballpark yeah. it well 50 miles is a good number though because that way you don't have to deal with too much weather stuff 50 miles away tell me an object that you can ever 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 see at 50 miles and no one's ever ever done that and it's so yeah that's that's by far our most um compelling thing is that what they were trying to do right there at the behind the or uh, what was it the behind the curve here at the end yeah kind, kind, kind of well that's just a, okay two things with behind the curve they included none of our long distance photography things in fact national geographic when they did their segment on us, got rid of all our long distance photography. Nobody wants to talk about it. science does not want to talk about it because really? what's, what's changed recently. It's like, well, how, how come we haven't figured this out over the last hundred, 200 years, at least, you know, with, with cameras and the difference is yeah. HD. Um, remember back in the day, I know you're not old enough, but back in the day with VHS kids, <laughs> we had big, oh, yeah. big, nice. big cameras, huge cameras that cost $3,000 and they didn't do anything. You could barely film your graduation with them and that you shot off anything off in the distance and it just became this blurry mess. Well, HD technology with, with zoom. Oh my, it's, it's extremely clear. So that's that's what's changed. That's why we uh, we get to do what we do. Sorry. So behind the curve, didn't want to touch that. So the laser experiment that they did, oh god, the the power of editing. <laughs> he, you know, there were two full blown experiments. Now Jaron completely botched the first one, where the the beam got as wide as him. You know, the thing was huge. He melted the condenser. The director didn't talk about it. You can't. That's another thing they don't tell you is you take a military grade laser which you're not supposed to buy illegally from China, but whatever, they'll ship them to you, which is, um, you can't leave them on constantly. It'll burn out. It'll, you'll burn out the, basically the condenser lens. And so he burned out the first one. They didn't talk about it. But what Jaron screwed up was he never went to that site and even uh, went to that location and checked line of sight before he did the test. He said, oh, we'll do it live on camera. First time I'm going, what do you not know? Are you kidding? What? And we didn't know he did this. And oh, really? uh, no, no. And so the director shot it. And then Jaron finally, months later, he's going, finally drove out there during the daytime and said, uh, it's like, oh, wow, look, it wasn't a flat surface after all. I was going, what? <laughs> Why did you do this? So he caught the most hell. And, and that's the only thing I would change from the movie. But again, if it wasn't that, the director was going to come after us anyway. Because, and I'll mention this to you because this relates to your class. In the iTunes version, uh, there's a director's commentary, and they and I didn't even know this. I was listening to the director's commentary, and they it was supposed to be a neutral human interest piece, mm -hmm. but then that 12 year old kid walked up to the microphone and asked me something during the conference. Right, he was supposed to be at school. Yep. He's asking me this thing, and everybody in the and in, in that film team just got so offended. They were like, "Oh really? no." No, it's all fun and games until the kids are involved. And it's like, we, and they said, they literally said, this is where we had to take a stand against the movie. And they all agreed. It's like, what? Like, we didn't force anybody to do anything. The kid was great. I, I thought it was a wonderful question. And he, and I appreciated that he was open minded. But no, no, that's, uh, so power of editing has the short version for you. I get you. So you guys still do your conferences then? I said that was what, 2017 was your first Yeah, one? yeah, yeah. So the, that was the first one we, that was the first big one we did. I mean, we haven't been doing it this long. Uh, we were supposed to do one in 2016, but people were thinking that we were going to do it for the money and stuff like that. And so we, we should do a conference. We were doing meetups in different cities. We've done hundreds of meetups. Um, so the first one was in Raleigh, North Carolina. The second one was in Denver, Colorado. 
and then the one we just did back in November was in Dallas, Texas. And I got to speak at the, uh, the I, I was going to speak at all three. So I spoke at the Rawling one. I was supposed to speak at Denver, but I walked out because of the Logan Paul issue. Which, and the kids are probably going, you, you wait, you show it to them. They'll be like, oh, Logan Paul, he's terrible. His, his demographic is middle school. He's, he's just this young YouTube. He's, he's kind of like the, um, uh, when, you know, the MTV series Jackass went off the air. The people went on YouTube and decided to just follow that. And he was one of those guys. It's like, let's punk people and, and mm -hmm. put it on YouTube and got a lot of followers. So I walked out. I didn't, why, they, they invited him last minute. And I said, yeah, I don't want to be anywhere near this kid. And then uh, the Dallas conference we did was great. Plus, but we also do international conferences. Last year, I did conferences in Los Angeles, Calgary, uh, South Carolina, um, London, and I opened the Gather Festival in Stockholm, which was weird because that wasn't even a flat Earth festival, and they had me yeah. oh, they had me open it, and it was like really, and, and I think the conference guy was actually one of ours, and he said, yeah, I wanted to mix it up a bit and and blow their minds right off the bat. And it's like okay, that's a good idea. So yeah, oh, I'm sorry, and we did one in um, Auckland. New Zealand. Okay, I was gonna say you guys are getting quite the following within the past couple of years. Oh yeah, it's definitely weird. Oh hell, I did I did a commercial. I did a, a television commercial in Melbourne last year, oh, really? where they called me up. They said, "Hey, how would you like to endorse our our mobile app?" And it's like, <laughs> okay. And I find out after I got down there that um because the 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 campaign was called Foolproof, funny, mm -hmm. and uh, I I said, "Why am I here? You could have hired Australian actors to pretend to be flat earthers and." And it was because some of the producers of that particular commercial were ours. We have people freaking <laughs> everywhere. It's awesome. That's crazy. That's crazy. Um, so I'm a, we're done with all questions. I'm just trying to think of things that oh, yeah, whatever. kind of come to mind. So, um, and AJ, if you're listening, you can always chime in too. Um, Is he still here? But one thing I was thinking of was um, you guys were talking about going, I think it was like your convention or something. Someone asked you about you collecting money and possibly going up and, and actually proven it and see this in actual world. How's that work? Okay. Couple things about the, about the uh, getting, getting money and proving it. And how would you prove it? That's, that's actually a great question. Um, first, let me address, uh, I probably should, because somebody's going to uh, ask eventually about the mad Mike thing that happened yeah. where, where, where Mike died recently. Uh, with the rocket guy out in California. Oh, yes. 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 So he that. was a daredevil first that came to us back in 2017, looking for money to finish one of his rockets. And we said, yeah, sure. Why? Well, you know, we'll, we'll give you money. You got to put a big flat earth sticker on the side of it, you know, endorse it. And, and that was fine. And he did that. He was supposed to be in the documentary as a matter of fact, but he, the producers said, well, we shouldn't just in case something horrible happens. So he didn't, and he, and he wasn't, but he got his own documentary on Netflix called um, uh, Rocket Man, which was interesting because it's the same name as the Elton John documentary, but whatever. And then he got on uh, Tosh.0, oh, and then he just landed a television show with the Science Channel. Go figure, right? Homemade Astronauts. That was the series that they were going to do. And he goes out there, and his parachute mal malfunctioned, and he crashed, and he died. Um, the you know, and people were you say, was he trying to prove flat Earth? No, he was only going a couple thousand feet up. He wasn't going to prove anything. But he was for the awareness part. Yeah, it was it was totally worth it. And you know, he knew the risk. He was a daredevil first. Flat Earth was not a high priority in his life. For him, it was girls, money, fame, uh, his rockets, and then maybe flat Earth. Um, as far as proving anything, there's two ways you could, you could prove flat earth to me. If you want me to quit flat earth and stop doing this, there's two things you could do. Um, the first thing would be to take a 4k camera, put it on a rocket, send it into or deep earth orbit or further, right? Have it pointed down at the ground, right? Don't have it moving around and don't ever hit the stop button. And, uh, and you know, when, when it takes off, cause the, the cameras always seem to drop off in the first or second stages or they cut to a, to another scene. It's like rocket goes up and after a hundred thousand feet, all of a sudden you have a Tesla in space. It's like, what, how did that happen exactly? And, and, you know, it doesn't even show the, the Falcon heavy deploying it or anything like that. It's like, there should be rockets tumbling in the background. Plus the car didn't self-destruct that car should have been shredded by the forces of, of a vacuum. And it didn't. 
Um, that'd be the first thing, which is put a 4K camera on a rocket. But if you don't want to spend that much money, if there's another way to prove it, because Antarctica is not going to happen. You, you, going to Antarctica is not going to prove anything. Um, would be the spacesuit challenge, which I put out to people, which is, okay, find me a spacesuit. You know, apparently in the history of spacesuits, for no apparent reason, they've been flawless. Nobody's ever died or gotten injured in a spacesuit accident. And that's going all the way back to the 60s to now. Right. So Mercury and Gemini and Apollo and Soyuz and the space station and space shuttle program. No one's ever had a problem with a spacesuit, even though the spacesuit itself has problem with thermodynamics. And the, my question, I even turned this into a clue. I said, tell me how a spacesuit works. Don't tell me about the oxygen and the nitrogen and the heating and cooling and the CO2 scrubbers. Tell me how it stops a vacuum because a spacesuit should turn into a basketball. Because it's just, you know, the pressure is just going to go outward. In fact, you can look this up on YouTube any day, any day, which is put it. All you have to do is type in in a vacuum chamber. I don't care if it's a can of soda, a basketball, a Stretch Armstrong, a He-Man, whatever it is. They all blow up into a balloon and they explode and are destroyed. So my challenge was, I said, give me a spacesuit. I go, loan me a spacesuit. Now, I don't have to own it. P put me in a vacuum chamber. There's tons of them out there. Put me in a vacuum chamber, yeah. crank it, hit the switch. Tell me what happens. Tell me how everything's fine. And remember, I can prove a vacuum chamber with like $5 worth of stuff from the dollar store, which is, you know, like a, like a little balloon, a glass of water, because water boils at room temperature in a vacuum, and a bell, because a bell can't make any sound in a vacuum. So you can't fake it, you know? And so, and yet, again, find, find me footage of astronauts in a vacuum chamber where you know it's all it's almost impossible to find in fact the the number one search when you type you know person in a vacuum chamber isn't an astronaut when you when you look it up it's james may from um oh, what's that british road show uh top gear where he they put him in a g suit it's not even in a vacuum it's not even a, a full-blown spacesuit and now does that prove a flat earth no but it goes a long way to proving the space program long long way um, sorry, I mean, if the, if everything, my, the short version of it is this, if everything, if the spacesuit is wrong, if the spacesuit cannot exist in real life, then everything that ever showed the spacesuit is also a lie. Um, and if you think I'm kidding, you can look up the wonderful videos. They're, these are not secret things. The early videos of uh, spacesuits that NASA was building during the early 1960s. And they were all a ridiculous B-movie, plastic and metal, and they were clunky, and they were ridiculous. And the, the que and question is, okay, why were they using those? Well, because they knew the physics behind it. A vacuum, you can't use soft material. You can't. It'll turn into a freaking basketball. So when someone came up with it, was a brilliant idea, and let me end it on this, which is somebody said, it's like, it's like, well, we can't use these suits. We have to use flexible suits. And it's like, we can't let, let use flex, flexible suits. Somebody's going to figure it out. And they'll say, no one's going to figure it out. Nobody knows physics. And that's what they did. And then it's like, okay, elbows, knees, everything's working. Fingers, really? You can build complex electronic stuff. You can plug in everything with those fingers and everyone's running around and with perfect articulation points. Nobody ever questioned it. Ever, ever. Huh. It was brilliant. Very interesting. AJ, if you can hear, do you have any questions? Maybe not. <laughs> I know he's taking care of his kids. Oh, no, that's so. fine. So, wait, he's typing something. Oh, is he typing something? Yeah, he's typing something. Uh, probably going to say kid crying. Uh, but anyway, I, yeah, I mean, there's plenty of, uh, if, if, if the kids are interested at all, there's a one, there's a wonderful playlist on my channel called flat earth shortlist for new people, which starts okay. out with a Shane Dawson video. If I'm not mistaken, he's really popular with the kids and, uh, goes into a lot of other videos, nothing specific without asking, being repetitive. Cause I haven't caught everything. I, I, that's fine. Um, the uh, and there's the videos running from five minutes to an hour or so long that, that go over just about everything you can think of. But the short version that I that I try to throw it at kids is this: it's like, look, it's not. And look, I love science. I think science is wonderful, but I don't think science is infallible. Uh, the the one of the examples I throw out there real fast is the um, the coelacanth fish which is just great, which is, you know, people say, well, dinosaurs, like, here, here's a great one for the kids. Are there dinosaurs swimming around Loch Ness? You know, the Loch Ness monster thing. Mm -hmm. No, why not? 
Well, because the dinosaurs have been extinct for at least 100 million years. Okay. Then you look up the coelacanth fish. The coelacanth fish, this unattractive fish that had been extinct for at least 70 million years. Every, every scientist in the world, every single scientist would have bet the farm on it. And then they caught one off of South Africa. And another one off of Madagascar. And then Mozambique. And then National Geographic finally caved in. It's like, oh yeah, look at that. <laughs> the fish is still around. So now tell me why there's no dinosaurs swimming around Loch Ness. And, and, and it's like, look, if that fish was even more, a little more elusive, it'd be even more groundbreaking today. And, and the thing is, science doesn't believe it until they get slapped in the face with a fish. And so that's why, and, and look, science, again, I love science, but science is not full of people that are absolutely infallible and incorruptible. You know, science will cut corners for the money. They will cut corners for the stockholders. They will, sorry, they will, uh, you know, do stuff every once in a while. But do I love science? Yes, we're talking on science. I'm to, I love the fruits of science, but they, I, I just wish they would be more flexible in some instances. Yeah. When they put their stamp on something, they can't just say, this is how it is, you know, no matter what. And it's like, okay, you know, the boiling temperature of water at sea level, that's one thing. Core of the earth, not so much. Yeah, and I wish I had teach it's always theory based. You know, science can always change. You have to have plenty of evidence out there. And oh, that's yeah. kind of how I got back to this flat earthers. The flat earther aspect is like, you know what? We're not going to, you know, call them names. We're not going to be rude about their ideas. As long as they have supporting evidence and reasoning, we have to, you know, acknowledge all that. And that's how I've always taught science is everything's theory based and it can change. I always tell them what I'm teaching you now in 20 years, 30 years down the road. It could be completely different the way that I'm teaching. You. I, I agree. And what, one more thing is, which it, people forget this. We don't, this was in the documentary. People, we don't like flat earth. Nobody gets into it thinking it's a great idea. Everybody hates it. And we, everyone tried to disprove it. That's in it now. It's just a question of how long you hold out. Some people can hold out for a couple of days. Some people, a couple of weeks. It took me nine months before I finally said, yeah. you know what? I can't prove the globe anymore. Here's why. And that's how everyone gets trapped and, and, and brought into it. So, um, you know, I, I agree with, with the thing. It's like, look, science, so, science does some wonderful, wonderful stuff. But like anything, it, it eventually gets into this habit of taking leaps of faith where, you know, where it's like, okay, we're the authority and it's a slippery slope. As you know, it's like, okay, I've got the white coat on. You're not that important. <laughs> You know, yeah. here, here's what I say. You should believe me. It's like, oh, okay. Anyway. Yeah. Well, I think that's it. <laughs> All right. I appreciate it, Mark. Oh, no, no. Appreciate it. And thank you to the class, whoever's listening. And again, don't take my word for it. Do your own research. Always ask questions. And, uh, you know, don't don't take everything at face value. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm sure we'll reach out to you some, some other time. Maybe we could do another session. Okay. Sounds great. All right. I appreciate it, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye.